Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. My favorite politician was Robert Kennedy. I loved him very much. And Larry Tai, the author, an award-winning journalist, has written the most wonderful book about Bobby Kennedy. It's called Bobby Kennedy, The Making of a Liberal Icon. And he's my guest today. Um, we talked last week about all of this. You agree that Bobby Kennedy is exceptional, was exceptional. The world would be different had he been elected, which we can only think that he was, would be. I think um, it's not a stretch to say that he would have been elected, and it's even less of a stretch to say that the world would have been different. Can you imagine two different people than Bobby Kennedy and Richard Nixon? And the idea Richard Nixon based his campaign on the whole notion of white backlash. And Bobby Kennedy, when he went into um, campaigning anywhere in America in 1968, he was the rare politician who would tell white audiences and black audiences precisely the same thing and precisely the opposite of what they wanted to hear. He said, we need number one safe streets. And the only way we're gonna get safe streets is to have racial justice. And it was extraordinary. And I think people were so shocked at hearing a politician tell the truth, mm -hmm. the hard truth, mm -hmm. that they actually bought into it and wanted to believe it. When he was in the Senate, uh, what did he do when the riots happened? So what he did with the riots, can I actually take yeah, you back to sure. one story? Yeah. And this was during the presidential campaign. And this, to me, was what had happened to Bobby Kennedy in terms of his sensitivity on racial issues. He started out when he was attorney general as relatively clueless mm -hmm. on civil rights. Much more important to him than people like the Freedom Riders taking their campaign of integrating buses across mm -hmm. the South. More important than that was not to embarrass Jack Kennedy. And so he asked the Freedom Riders to slow down. He asked the whole civil rights movement to sort of to have faith that the Kennedy's slow approach was gonna work. But by 1968, he had been transformed. And on what I think of as the most momentous night of his campaign in 1968, in April, when he was campaigning in Indiana, he flies into Indianapolis and he's greeted at the airport by the young mayor named Richard Luger, who says to Bobby, I have horrible news for you. Martin Luther King has been shot and killed. He says, you will not go in tonight, Senator Kennedy, and give the speech that you were planning to give in the middle of the black ghetto of Indianapolis. You won't go in because you might not come out alive and because you will create a riot. And Bobby thoughtfully listened and then went into the black community. He jumped up on the back of a flatbed truck and he proceeded for the next five minutes to give what may have been the most pitch people. perfect speech that any. I would only had. say that I can also feel in my own heart the same kind of feeling. I had a member of my family killed, but he was killed by a white man. But we have to make an effort in the United States. We have to make an effort to understand, to get beyond or go beyond these rather difficult times. But he said the response was to go home and say a prayer for Martin Luther King and for the country, and a prayer for racial justice and a prayer for human understanding. And something miraculous happened that night, that he went in to embrace the black community for the loss of Martin Luther King, and instead that community embraced him for the loss of Jack Kennedy. In more than 100 cities across America, there were race riots that night. One of the only cities with a large black population that didn't riot was Indianapolis, and that was because of Robert Francis Kennedy. From that moment, to the end of his campaign, any time he campaigned in a black ghetto, there were strange signs that went up at the back of the crowd. And the signs said very simply, white, but all right. Now that may not sound like much, but 50 years ago, for black Americans to say that about any white politician, to not just have the faith, but to truly adore somebody like they did Bobby Kennedy, he was a very special guy. It, he, he gave people hope. <laughs> You know, it was optimistic. The that was the key to everything that he did. It was never looking back. It was looking ahead with a sense that no matter how bad the problem, be it racial intolerance, be it Vietnam and the war we were in there, he gave people a sense that we could be better and they wanted to believe in it. And that is what we are most lacking today is a sense of optimism and hope. Right. The contrast between 
His campaign and what's happening today is so staggering in the times. I wrote this book as a matter of history, looking back at what had happened 50 or 60 years ago, and I had no clue that it would come out as not about history, but as giving us some sense of optimism about what politicians could be doing today. Bobby Kennedy is Hillary Clinton's role model, and we will hopefully someday see evidence that she is meeting this standard of authenticity that yeah. he did. Once she's elected. Once she's elected. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> he, um, he and Johnson had this terrible relationship. They hated each other, mm. basically. But what could have happened if the two of them had gotten together? So <laughs> With a great I want society. to back up one second and say that in his life, Bobby Kennedy had four people he truly detested. <laughs> Three of them he showed pretty good judgment on. One was Roy Cohn, Jimmy Hoffa's, uh, I'm sorry, Joe McCarthy's yeah. young aide who ended up becoming Donald Trump's tutor yeah. in later life. A second one was J. Edgar Hoover, the despicable FBI director. A third one was Jimmy Hoffa, the corrupt. seemingly corrupt head of the Teamsters movement, and sadly the fourth one was Lyndon Johnson. They despised one another, I think, because they came from such different worlds. Bobby Kennedy was, in Johnson's world, one of the Harvards, as he called it. Yeah. One of the East Coast intellectuals grown up with all kinds of privilege. Johnson was East Texas Community College grown up in poverty. They couldn't understand one another at all. And what we lost because of that was a sense that the two people in America, in the political world in America of the 1960s, who were most passionate about ending poverty, about giving us a strong civil rights bill, these two guys couldn't get along. Had they gotten along, I think we could have done even better on civil rights, on poverty, and most importantly, that we could have done better on getting out of Vietnam yeah, earlier. Yeah. I think Johnson, must have had an inferiority complex. And Bobby, when you think about it, I mean, when, and Jack Kennedy, they grew up with such confidence. That's another Joe Kennedy effect. It was. <laughs> effect. So Lyndon Johnson. So Johnson thought he was always looking down on him, and he wasn't. So Johnson <laughs> understood that Bobby Kennedy didn't want him to be vice president. Mm -hmm. Johnson understood that Bobby Kennedy had a closer relationship with the president than his vice president did. And Johnson understood that Bobby Kennedy would someday be running for president. And Johnson's greatest fear is that he would be bookended by two Kennedys in the White House and that he would be forgotten. And Johnson had so much going for him and he was the president. Yeah. And he could have reached out to Bobby and Bobby could have reached back in a way that could have changed history. Mm. So um, he, he ran for president. Mm. Johnson was running, McCarthy was running. The group that was against the Vietnam War, Al Lowenstein, this Dump Johnson movement, all of us peace liberal people uh, wanted to stop Johnson from being renominated. And he was under pressure from this group. And he knew, I mean, he, he knew he wanted to run for president, mm. but he didn't really want to run in 68. And wasn't he really afraid of the power Johnson had that if he announced his, his, um, uh, his running, that Johnson was able to do something that would make it something happen that would be bad? So he was absolutely afraid <laughs> Having of that. such trouble. He was afraid that if he were running for president and came out as strongly as he knew he would against Vietnam, that it would make Johnson want to bomb more and do exactly the opposite of what Bobby was urging to be done. And so what happened was a sort of tragic beginning to his campaign. Um, it was exactly in the New Hampshire primary that year, your viewers will recall that um, a liberal senator from Minnesota named Eugene McCarthy. When Bobby Kennedy wouldn't pick up the anti-war cudgel, McCarthy went in, contested the New Hampshire primary against Johnson, and when you added in the Republican write-ins with the Democratic mm -hmm. votes, he actually mm -hmm. narrowly beat Johnson. So just after Johnson is shown to be vulnerable in New Hampshire, exactly four days afterwards, Bobby Kennedy jumps in. And all the press that had basically thought in the 50s that Bobby was a, was a ruthless character reconstituted their image of Bobby as ruthless. A columnist named Murray Kempton wrote a telegram to Ted Kennedy saying, your brother's entry into the New Hampshire primary proves that St. Patrick <laughs> didn't drive all the snakes out of Ireland. <laughs> but the truth was that it was exactly the opposite, that nine days before the New Hampshire primary, Bobby Kennedy had told reporters like Marty Nolan of the Boston Globe and had told his staff that he was planning to run but he felt that McCarthy had jumped in where he wouldn't, and he wanted to give McCarthy, Gene McCarthy, a clear shot at Johnson. 
So he was ham-handed, but he wasn't ruthless. And he had to spend that entire campaign trying to prove, especially to the press corps, that he was not the bad guy they saw him. I knew he was going to run. You did know. I knew, happens. you know, I even knew in January. I always, I thought he was always going to run. I think that in that space, he really decided at one point he was going to run in early February or something. And then the Pueblo happened. So various things happened like the Pueblo and incident. And that's what put him back into... It did, but it was also a sense of fairness mm -hmm. to McCarthy. He didn't like Gene McCarthy, but he felt that it would be a bad thing to come in and sort of and mm -hmm. upstage him early on. And that was another conflict, to, like Johnson. It was the Irish Catholic conflict. He, said, he told me once that uh, Eugene McCarthy thought he, that he knew more Thomas Aquinas than either of the Kennedys. So, that <laughs> so it was that kind of conflict. And Bobby Kennedy <laughs> was distraught over the fact that Gene McCarthy had what he called the A students the college yeah, students who right. were the best, and Bobby ended up with the C students. And Bobby thought that young people and young college people were his natural constituency. Mm -hmm. And I think by the time of his death, he had won he back was. most of them. Yeah. And also, he was so much more rounded as a candidate. I mean, Absolutely. Eugene McCarthy was nowhere, was he? With So he was more rounded as a candidate, <laughs> clearly, than McCarthy. Gene McCarthy was nowhere when it came to civil rights or came to poverty. Right. But Bobby Kennedy and race. was much more prepared to be president than Jack Kennedy had been. Bobby had, been, had seen the way the Senate worked as a senator and as a Senate staffer. He had been his brother's chief domestic and foreign policy advisor. He was so primed to be president that in 1968, he was ready to go. And he would not have just been an idealistic president. He would have been a kick butt get things done kind of president. He was a very practical person. He combined. And he could go through. He had this clear vision through all the rhetoric of what really needed to get done. He did. So he yeah. was, in a way, an amalgam between Lyndon Johnson and Jack Kennedy, and I think between Niccolo Machiavelli and Che Guevara. <laughs> and he just he combined this passion with a get it done yeah. sense. He, um, I, I think another, Johnson, thinking that he didn't have the background and wasn't as educated as Kennedy. I think that what drove Bobby, made him uh, impatient with people was when they were really pompous. <laughs> he hated pomposity. Um, so I think if we look again in today's terms, um, we know that Barack Obama's role model, that Bill Clinton's role model was Jack Kennedy, Barack Obama's role model was Bobby Kennedy. And I think Barack Obama came closest to being a Bobby Kennedy kind of character. And the one thing that I think he most lacked was a sense of how to get things done, particularly in Congress, that Bobby Kennedy would have been as idealistic and almost as eloquent as Barack Obama, mm -hmm. but he knew how to make things happen. Yeah, it was a lack of experience mm -hmm. in Obama's background or exactly. something. What was the difference? I've always thought about this. To me, Jack Kennedy was I can't say this with a straight face, but almost a lightweight compared to Bobby Kennedy. Is that, do you f n understand that feeling? So I think Jack Kennedy may have been book smarter than Bobby Kennedy, more of an intellectual, but Bobby had this instinct of how to make things happen that he would have been more effective. He was, to me, more convincing and compelling a character, but would have been more effective as a politician, he was a much better senator, even though he was senator for just four years, than his brother Jack was in twice that long. And I think he would have been a more effective and much less cautious president than Jack Kennedy was. A common strain also with these guys was their humor. Mm. <laughs> so their humor was wonderful, and Jack had a wonderful, ironic sense of humor. Bobby's humor, again, was more personal. He was shyer than Jack was. He was sort of slower. To, for people to feel comfortable with, and yet the people who were closest to him, people like you who spent real time with him, came away with a sense that this guy had an ironic sense about everything, including yeah. about himself and his privilege. Yeah. yeah. He also had so many circles of different kinds of people, mm. friends, right? It, he, uh, that's what fascinated me. He did, and he went to people. He was the only person in any position of power in Washington in the early 1960s who had his friends include people who ran the SDS, people like Tom Hayden, yeah. who 50 years later still adore Bobby Kennedy. He was the one guy in New York when he was a senator. He set up 
an alternative model for how to p fight poverty in the biggest ghetto in America, in Bedford-Stuyvesant. And it was only Bobby Kennedy who could go into a community like that that had seen all kinds of well-meaning white liberals come in and had totally given up on them. And Bobby Kennedy came in and convinced them that he was different. And he was different. He brought IBM and Tom Watson into Bedford-Stuyvesant. He brought the establishment of New York and understood that people who had made their money in this city had a responsibility to give something back. And he had a way of somehow bringing people, the most powerful people and the least powerful people in the country together in his wider circle. Did he ever have to vote on taxes? Um, so <laughs> he did, and he was not somebody, he was not the classic um, liberal Democrat of that time, the sort of tax and spend kind of guy. He understood that there were limits to what government programs could do, there were limits to how much you could tax people, and yet he understood also that taxing for the right purposes, not for fighting a war in Vietnam, but for ending poverty, was worth doing. So I think he would have been willing when he had to to raise taxes, but he would have spent people's money in a way that gave them confidence that government was worth investing. Like more food stamps. <laughs> like more food stamps. <laughs> he also, he had a, an office that had very passionate liberal people, mm. but he had friends that were Jack's friends who were older and I think more conservative in their ways. Absolutely, and the Jack Kennedy people- And he didn't neglect either side. No, the Jack Kennedy people looked very conservative next to Bobby's young staffers. People like Peter Edelman and Adam Walensky were firebrands, they were radicals of that era. And Jack Kennedy's people, the Ted Sorensons and the um, Pierre Salingers looked like old conservatives next to that, and yet Bobby had a way of bringing them both together and having them learn from one another in a way that was extraordinary. It's very interesting. And Joe Dolan, who ran his office. I love Joe Dolan. Yes. So <laughs> what I don't want to convey is an impression that Bobby Kennedy was a saint. And the early Joe <laughs> McCarthy era and things that he did during the Cuban Missile Crisis mm -hmm. and helping get us into that suggests Bobby Kennedy was no saint, but it suggests <laughs> that he learned. And if the later Bobby Kennedy, the Bobby Kennedy of 1968, was judging the Bobby Kennedy of 1954 in the McCarthy era, he would have been harsher than I was in the book in judging that. Yeah. You tell the story about how he went to Joe McCarthy's funeral. Mm. And uh, he, he was very loyal to his friends. He was... I mean, it really didn't matter who the friends were. He had a certain loyalty that never disappeared. So there were two sides of Bobby Kennedy that he showed when he went to Joe McCarthy's funeral in 1957 in Wisconsin. One was the loyal side, and the fact that America had repudiated McCarthy wasn't going to keep Bobby away from the funeral. And yet when he was at the funeral, <laughs> he wanted nobody to know that he was there. So he was, on the one hand, protecting his brother Jack, it wouldn't look good if his, Jack's younger brother was at conservative Joe McCarthy's funeral. So Bobby goes there, he scrubs the record clean of the fact that he was there. And one thing we have to remember is, while Bobby Kennedy believed in Joe McCarthy, Bobby Kennedy was the chief author of the Democrats' report after the Army McCarthy hearings. He wrote the report that the Democrats signed on to repudiating McCarthy, and it was such a compelling report that the majority of the the majority Republicans bought most of that report. So Bobby Kennedy worked for McCarthy and helped bring down McCarthy. It's, he also never lost that practical side, no matter what he did, right? What I was fascinated, though, when you said with the Bay of Pigs that he kind of rewrote the history a little bit. He, was a, he could change, he could make things disappear if he so wanted. <laughs> I wrote my first book on a man named Edward Bernays, who was the father of spin in America, mm -hmm. and Bobby was the son of spin. He <laughs> understood how to rewrite history, and if you read the defining narrative on the, Bay, on the Cuban Missile Crisis was Bobby's book called 13 Days. And if you read that book, you would think two things that weren't true. <laughs> One was that Bobby, and not Jack, was president, and the other was that Bobby <laughs> was a pacifist, wanting a blockade during all 13 days. And the fact is, the first six or seven days, Bobby Kennedy was all for attacking with bombing, with, for bombing the heck out of Cuba. Once they saw the missiles. Once yeah. they saw the missiles. And it was only in the later period that he decided that a blockade and not an invasion was the route to go. It's so interesting, right? Mm. Now, in the campaign, I mean, he also, the first, they, because he got into it so late, mm. um, he had to skip some primaries, and the first one was Indiana? Right, so the first primary in 68 was Indiana. And that's where his political instinct 
showed again, right? So it was extraordinary. As a guy myself from Massachusetts, I understood how little Bobby understood about Indiana. One day when he was campaigning in the Midwest and when a page of his speech blew off, blew away, he said, there goes my farm policy. <laughs> he knew nothing, and yet he was such an incredible politician. He was running in Indiana, not just against Senator Gene McCarthy, but against the favorite son governor named Brannigan, who when he was sober was an incredible politician. And Bobby understood how to appeal to the people of Indiana, partly by talking about his being the chief law enforcement officer and suggesting that he understood what law and order was about, but he never gave up on the other side of that equation. And he could go into African-American communities and appeal to people. He won the vote of blacks, and he won the vote that George Wallace had won four years before in Indiana. And that was a little bit of a miracle. So that was the coalition that put it together. The extraordinary coalition. He had all these different people working with him in his campaign. Um, and it was fascinating to see, right? Who, and, and they really didn't trust local organizations. So they were called the Honorary Kennedys, and he would fly them into a state like Indiana, and they were a guy named Doherty from Massachusetts, who all of these old Massachusetts politicians who had helped Jack Kennedy become president, and Bobby knew he needed them along with the locals. He would never trust either one alone to do it. And this was the way he was building a coalition that I think would not just have won the White House, but it would have won the agenda yeah. that he went in with. He, well, he built it also in New York when he was the senator because he had, you know, the bosses. He was the boss's candidate, Absolutely. right? And yet he had these liberal left-wing people supporting him. So I mean, his favorite expression was, they were with Jack in 60, and those were the New York bosses, but he <laughs> didn't know how to appeal to both sides. He didn't love them, I must say. He didn't love the bosses, but he didn't love the liberals either. He had yeah. skepticism about everybody. Yeah. He used to say, I can't, what am I doing with you? Everybody complains or something. And I would say, well, all my people complain about you, so we're even. You know, it's funny. But he, um, I remember being asked to work on a surrogate race, which is the, not, not the Silverman race, but earlier Chris McGrath mm. and, uh, and Kevin McGrath were two advanced men for Kennedy. And their father was the surrogate in the Bronx. <laughs> and they were afraid he was going to be defeated by a reformer. I mean, it was that kind of loyalty that he had. That always. kind of loyalty and also that kind of understanding that it was offices that nobody knew existed, like the surrogates, yeah. that mattered, that people's lives were affected by Yeah, them. he was really interested in some of that. He never took hold, though, in the, in the state political stuff. Never. It just didn't. So people wanted him to become the great savior of the Democrats in New York, and that wasn't who he was, but mm -hmm. he was a savior of the mm -hmm. people of New York in a lot of ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so the campaign, I mean, he lost Oregon, and that was the, that's the one campaign, really, that they didn't have one of their people in, right? I love that part of it. Exactly. Explained. <laughs> so he goes into Oregon, and he campaigns in a way that was much too cautious. He wouldn't debate Gene McCarthy. He didn't quite get this was a state without large minority populations, and he didn't quite get Oregonians. And he campaigned in a way that I think 50 years later was a really noble way. He campaigned for gun control in a state that liked guns. He campaigned for issues of minority rights in a state that didn't have minorities, and he lost there. And he understood that California was the show, that either you win California or you're out of this thing. And he campaigned hard, he campaigned passionately, he campaigned going back to his liberal instincts, and he won California by enough votes that 50 years later, all the surviving Gene McCarthy people say that they were willing to jump ship, that they knew McCarthy couldn't do it, and they were going to go with Bobby after that win in California. That was a big rift, the McCarthy. I still look at people and think, well, that was a McCarthy supporter. Exactly. You know, it was really, it was an amazing rift. It mattered. The rift really mattered. People resented Bobby's coming in late. And yet, I'm convinced the bigger rift would have been the rift with Hubert Humphrey, and more importantly, the rift with Richard Nixon, and people would have come around. Mm. And Bobby Kennedy was authentic enough that he would have won over those McCarthy mm -hmm. people. Did he have a sense of his mortality? An incredible sense of his mortality. Having lost three older siblings, he had a sense, and reading the Greek tragedies that Jackie Kennedy had him reading, he had a sense that it was all ephemeral, that it could go away, and that was why he was so determined to get things done quickly. 
I, I never thought of his being killed. It never occurred to me. I mean, I remember the pleasure of walking down the street and s people say, oh, there's Bobby Kennedy, you know, or something, or sitting in a car and the driver next door sees you. Uh, it just never occurred to me. But he was always, you think, in his mind? So it was not in his mind only. He would talk to people about the fact he understood just how vulnerable he was, and yet he only had one armed security guard, and that was an ex-FBI agent named Bill Barry. He was great. <laughs> and the night in California that Bobby died, Bill Barry, at Bobby's instruction, was back in the, at the stage helping a pregnant Ethel Kennedy get off the stage when Bobby was in the kitchen being shot. And 50 years later, Bill Barry has never forgiven himself for not being It's there. such a shame because he was so great and so loyal to, to Bobby and it was such a good relationship. So the funeral train, the end of Bobby Kennedy, the tribute couldn't have been more touching. So there have only been f two funeral trains like that in the history of America. One was for Abe Lincoln when he was going to his burial, and the other was for a guy who never made it to be president, Bobby Kennedy. A million people lined the tracks between New York and Washington, and that million people, it was conservative whites, it was poor blacks, it was kids, it was the elderly, those were Bobby's Kennedy's Americans, and they were there to say goodbye. It was the most touching thing, see people this way and holding signs and it was an incredible thing. And inside the train, Ethel Kennedy was going up right. and down the aisles, basically thanking people for being there. This is a woman right. who with was Joe pregnant Kennedy. with her 11th child. She and her eldest son, Joe Kennedy, were the host and hostess. And it was extraordinary that they could pull it together that way. Thank you so much for this wonderful book. It's, uh, I hope people will read it and think that, and know that the world could be a better place and that right. we could have better people in leadership roles. I appreciate your having me on. Thank you. We at CUNY TV always like to hear from our viewers. So if you have any subjects you'd like to explore or people you'd like to hear, please let us know. Write to us at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or go to our website, cuny.tv, and click on Contact Us. We look forward to hearing from you.